tends to be an area that I think a lot of people don't have much sensitivity to, or maybe they have a lot of sensitivity to it, just don't think about it in these ways. Uh, I come from a very strong set of bias. Uh, and so as I, I go through the information that I'm going to share with you, please feel free to stop me at any time, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. Now, I gave out something called the real me. Did you ever see this? If, if you need one. Uh, and all I'd like you to do is just sort of Anybody else? Oh. Uh, uh, and just circle on, on the sheet, front and back, those things that are um, consistent with who you are. And then once you've circled those things, tabulate each section. So, uh, for example, this first quadrant, um, there might be you lift weights or you watch TV. Whatever. Just just circle the things you do. Yes? Do you have the acting something? I can't understand. Acting. I'm not sure. On the same mind. Mind? So just take a, a, a minute to do these. too concerned about absolutes on this because it's certainly open to interpretation. So make it whatever you want. <laughs> Usually, uh, if I teach a lot with a certain group, I do a lot of these things up front and I do personality profiles on you. So watch out. So I get to say, oh, I know that person is really this way. I won't. Uh, you can play with this, but I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, so, so let's go ahead and get going. First of all, uh, as you begin to think about this, uh, about this idea of a learning gap, and I'll explain these in a little bit more detail, but these are fairly specific to this presentation. Uh, secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the eight intelligences, and you've already started to warm up because the handout I gave you begins to help you get a little bit of a profile on yourself in terms of where your preferences are. Uh, and it really doesn't matter where your preferences are, it just gives you an idea to sense where you're at. Um, I'd like to talk about the three visions of MI, and, and really, for me, the visions are really important <coughs> piece. And they're really important because I think it's the part that many times we don't look at. We talk about the MIs, but we don't look at the visions. And then the four elements of effective learning and have fun. Uh, so by the time you leave today, those are the things I'd like you to have within grasp in terms of what we're going to do. Uh, I, I do a workshop for instructors here. I used, I used to. I started it 14 years ago. Uh, and of course, I've since just retired. But um, it's called an instructional skill workshop. It is a, a workshop, a four-day workshop that we do with instructors that focuses on this concept of how do we teach best and promote learning. So a lot of these materials come from a man by the name of Kagan. And he did a lot of work in elementary and public education. He still has workshops all over the country on learning and cooperative education. So a lot of his concepts are weaved through here. Uh, and they've worked for me. And that's where I'm coming from. So obviously, ground rules. Uh, we talked about these before. Obviously, you don't need to have more. Uh, but I'd like you to introduce yourself to the person in front of or behind you if you haven't already done that. Maybe you don't know. So you don't Okay. 
Okay, so um, I'd like you to identify a couple things for me. And this will be similar to what we did in the first presentation, but more focused on here. And just so you understand content, I always start off with what my goals are, and then I always try to create something called a bridge. And usually the bridge is to get you hooked into why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. So this is the first bridge. So what I'd like you to do is identify what was the most powerful learning experience you've ever had. Now, here's the kicker. I'll bet you it wasn't in school. Right? Most of our really powerful learning experiences are not in the context of the classroom. If they are, you are privileged. Because you must have had one heck of a learning structure. Or you must have been really ready for new information. Second, <laughs> what keeps your interest and attention in class? Now you've got to look at this guy really close to understand what he's doing. So what keeps your interest in class? Oh, you got it! Oh, yeah! <laughs> you got it? With the person next to you, what keeps your interest in a class? Talk to him. Kick out a couple of things. What keeps your interest? David, I heard you say something. Engaging. Engaging. Engagement. With the instructor or, or with the content? Uh, either. Either. If the content is something that you're fascinated by, then it doesn't really matter what the delivery is because you want to take it in as much as you can get. Okay? But then the other piece to it is how is it delivered? And that's really what we're talking about. So we're going to make an assumption that the things we are learning and the things we are teaching are things that we're both passionate about. Okay? So if you were going to give this award, what would you give it to? What instructor in your life was inspiring for you? And then what qualities did they have made that experience powerful for you. Got it? Okay. You, yes, absolutely. Three. You can pick as many as you want. Okay. I'm not going to test you, so it's okay. <laughs> if you're fortunate to have multiples, that's great. Now, there are two pieces to this in terms of where you stand as both a student or a faculty person. The first is that as a student, I do my homework before I will ever waste my time in a class. I don't take classes from people that I know can't hold my attention and promote meaning for me. And I will tell you as a student, life is too short. When I taught my stress management class, I told my students that if this were the last day of the rest of your life, would you like to be here? And most of them said, no, but it's not. And I said, how do you know? Life is too short to give it away in a place or thing that isn't promoting meaning or power for you. So can you answer these questions? Just shortly, you don't have to think much about them, but do you know what the eight MIs are? Okay. Do you understand when I talk about the three visions of education? Do you understand what the five elements of good teaching are and what makes learning fun for you? Most of you can answer the last one without too much trouble. The other three are really 
localized to this discussion. Okay. So if I were to look at education, what I do and why I do what I do, and if I were to look at my purpose in life, it's about discovering gifts. If I can help you discover your gifts, your life will be so much richer. And so that's how I view what I do. And in terms of your job as tutors, you are helping people to discover their gifts. And if you can do that, they'll remember you forever. I had a, a I used to teach senior citizens. I had a senior citizens fitness class. Okay. And it was really sort of a misnomer because I had traditional students in there too. But my youngest student was 17 and my oldest was 94. Okay. One of my young guys in the 70s came to me and he said, man, I just had the neatest thing happen. What happened, Bob? He said, I was in TCBY or some ice cream place and a mother came up to me and she said, you tutored my son and you helped him understand how math works. And that single thing was the high point of his month. And you have the opportunity to do that every day. So as you begin to think about these, think in those terms. So just two stories. Uh, I shared with you that I was a physical education instructor earlier in my career. And my first, uh, I didn't start working until I was a little older. Uh, I went to undergraduate school and then I spent two years in the Peace Corps. Uh, and then after Peace Corps, I got a job in the Y for four years or six years. And then, then I started to teach after that. But when I was in graduate school in Colorado, I worked at a camp for multiply handicapped students. I had great students. They were great. And this is a picture of a little guy that looks similar to Steve. And he was in that class. And I was teaching trampoline. Okay? And so I took all the kids in the class, and I had mute, I had blind, I had deaf students, I had paraplegics, and I had multiples. So in this case, he was both mute, he could not talk well, couldn't understand because he had hard of hearing, and he had leg braces. He couldn't, he had foot braces from here down. And so we were in class, and I'm teaching this event, and I knew he couldn't do it, but he kept going, <coughs> okay? And I, finally I said, okay, okay. So I lifted him up and I rolled him onto the tram. Now the trick I was teaching was called a back over. Does anybody know what a back over is? Okay, you just sort of jump up and down, you go down onto your back, pull your feet over your head, and you land on your butt. Can you picture it? Anybody want to try it? Okay. So this kid gets onto the tramp, and he stands on the side of the tramp, right on the steel part. And I, I teach from the top of the tramp. I teach up right on the bed, so I, I could hold him. And immediately he goes like this. And he releases both braces, falls back, pulls him over his head, and does a perfect seat drop. <laughs> I tell you the story because Steve's learning problem wasn't his. Who was the problem? Me. I didn't believe that Steve could do that. And I got in the way of his success. And I think all too often, when we run into students who aren't succeeding, we say it's their problem. And I want to challenge you and say, no, I, I don't think it's as much their problem as our understanding of what their capabilities are. We don't know anybody else's potential. And there are hundreds and hundreds of stories that revolve around the use of MI, and I'll try to share some of them. There's another piece to this. They said that I was a Peace Corps volunteer. You need to know that I had to take Spanish in high school. I was at the bottom of my class. I still remember my instructor, Mr. Vanuck. Mr. Vanuck should not have been teaching Spanish. Okay. For two years, I endured in his class. And in New York,
York State at that time, you had to take a Regents if you wanted to go to college, take college credit. So I was getting 60s. We had a, a number system. I was getting 50s and 60s in this class. Oh, man. But then this Regents thing comes up, and I have to take a Regents. And I take the Regents, but I studied really hard for the Regents, and I got a 66. 65 was passing. So in order for me to get out of that class, he had to give me an 84 so that I would, because I passed the Regents, he had to pass me for the course. So to get my average up, he did that. So I left high school, and by the way, you need to know a couple of other things. One, I'm dyslexic. Okay, I always have had learning problems, especially with reading. I was tutored in reading all through my early school years. And I got to tell you, the tutoring didn't do any good, but I fell in love with my instructor. And Mrs. French was a sweet, sweet soul. She turned me on to learning, but I never got good at reading out loud. But you need to know, that's where I was coming from out of high school. <clears throat> my high school counselor said, you need to go to a trade school. But in that point in time, I said, no, I'm going to go to college. So I go through college, and ironically, I. I get very good grades because I didn't know how to work. And then I got out of college, and my dream was to go in the Peace Corps. And in 1960s, that was where I was. So I went into the Peace Corps, I signed up for the Peace Corps, and guess what? I asked for an English-speaking country because Spanish was going to kill me. Where did they send me? Spain. Venezuela. <laughs> OK? I get. So I go through language training with Alan Goldsmith, and Alan and I were at the same language level. We were both very demonstrative. Alan could communicate anything with his hand, but if you asked him to conjugate Spanish, it wasn't going to happen. So I end up in Venezuela. I end up in a site called Punto Pio. And for a year, I walk around with a dictionary in my pocket. And I like people, and we had some friends there who were um, Venezuelan. And we would go out and play dominoes. Any of you play dominoes? Dominoes is a great game. It's even better when you drink beer with it. <laughs> and I found that if I had more beer, then my language got better. Yeah. Because I wasn't as inhibited, and I wasn't carrying all that baggage. The bottom line is, when I left South America, I was a three plus on a five scale. I was speaking a little bit better than a native speaker. And what that taught me was, it wasn't that I had a problem with Spanish. What it taught me is that's not the way I learned. I did not learn from Mr. Bernard. I learned from doing. And a lot of your people that you work with are doers. Okay, So that's where we're coming from. So let's talk about the learning gap. This is, this is the way I see it. What was taught you? You all have tons of stuff that are taught. And then, what you learn. How many of you have thought, you're sitting in the class going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Then they do the exam, what happens? Where'd it go? I knew how to do that. Where'd it go? You didn't really learn it. You just experienced some pieces to it. One of the things I tell people is uh, to, to make a parallel. And I'm, I, I don't mean to promote any religion. A lot of people will say, I know God. And then there'll be people that say, I know about God. And there's a big difference. It's one thing to know about it. It's not another thing to know it. You don't really know it until you can teach it. So that's what we're going to talk about. Making sense? So. There have been a lot of great people, and I, I'm going to run short on time, so I'm not going to buzz this, but if you get out of line, yeah, we, maybe we do go. Uh, this may stop everything, and if it does, we'll have to, yeah, yeah we did. Uh, but if you look online and you just punch up, punch up famous people, you will find that there have been very, a great number of famous people that have had real learning issues, lots of them. And we make an assumption, because we see them in their jet planes, that they must have it all together and life was easy. No, it's not so. 
sometimes I think the greatest gift I ever received was being dyslexic. It was a gift. Because I tend to be more creative. I tend to be physical and do. And I tend to relate people differently. So I, I challenge you to think of these obstacles that may be presented not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity. So let's talk about brain-based learning. What does it do? Um, that's not my brain, just so you know. But if you, if you begin to do the research and you look at brains, you'll see that a number of things happen. And this comes from a couple of different places. Gardner's material was original. He started it out. Kagan's stuff was popularized. And Medina did some stuff on brain rule. There's tons of stuff out there now. And we're hearing lots, lots more about neuroplasticity. Anybody know what that is? <coughs> Want to share? It's the, it's the ability of the brain to change and uh, adapt. Exactly. So. The ability of the brain to change and adapt. So even though the early years are critical in development, if I were going to spend money on education, I'd spend it with the early years for kids because it sets foundational options, some of which are not recoverable. But on the other hand, we know that the brain continues to change and develop over years. And one of the things you're going to see as we look at this is we know that the essentials of multiple intelligence are the more ways you teach, the more confident you can be as a learner. Excuse me, the more ways you learn, the more confident you can be as a learner. Now, change the word to teach. It's the same thing. So when you're starting to look at working with people, if you deliver things, you're going to deliver in one way. So here's what I'd like you to do real quickly. Look at that sheet I gave you. Okay, look at the sheet. And think about this sheet as it relates to the next eight things we're going to talk about. And I think one of the things you're going to see is that most of us teach from our bias. So if you're a verbal linguistic person, and you like to talk, and you like to lecture, guess what? That's how you're going to teach. And I challenge you to get out of the rut, to risk a little bit. Because your risking may open a door for someone that is totally different. And it does take a risk. So what do we know? Using multiple intelligence can do the following. Do you believe that? Do you know why? David, why? Why do you think that happened? It allows you to take different approaches to things. Yes, but more importantly, it creates more connections in your brain. And the more connections you have, the more you network in your brain, the more you're able to make one learning connected to something else. And guess what? When we test you for IQ, it goes up. You'll see it later, but it says essentially that you develop more neural pathways in your brain. That neuroplasticity is expanded. Increases learning, creates connections. The more connections you have, if I can connect one thing to something else to something else, you'll remember it more easily. How many of you have ever taken courses in memory? Okay. One of the key tools in memory is to help you develop connections. We're going to do that before, as I go into this next section, I hope. OK. So if this is your brain, and I said it increases connections, it just engages the brain at more levels. That's the key. That's the focus of what I want to be. And then for the teacher, MI reduces behavior issues. Why? How many of you have kids that are just off in space in your class? or you are. Okay. If you have an engaging instructor, it's hard to not be present. If you are in an environment of learning that works for you, you will not mess up and misbehave. And if you have any questions, go visit elementary school classrooms. You will get a lot better sense of what I'm talking about in terms of behavior. But even at our level, 
at the college level, it's not uncommon to have behavior issues in class. That's why guns should be permitted on campus. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, and then it says in increases success, that's obvious. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the eight intelligence. Verbal linguistic is one. Now, we'll go over these in more detail. Now, here's what I would like you to do. On the back of a sheet of paper, as I go through these, I want you to start drawing a picture. Okay? As I go through these, I want you to draw a picture. I had to make sure this was dry erase because I've done it more than once. So, one verbal linguistic. Now, we'll do this in a minute in more detail. Two, logical math. Some people see everything by numbers. You know the, the, the TV show Numbers? That guy tries to interpret everything through numbers. Bodily kinesthetic. But don't get too concerned about these yet. Musical rhythmical. Visual spatial. Naturalist. Interpersonal and inter interpersonal. Those are the basic eight. Now, of course, you're sitting here thinking, yeah, so? So let's take a look at them in a little more detail. So if you look at visual spatial, okay, this person sees the world in shapes and sizes. So I would like you to, I'd like you to, on your paper, somehow draw something that looks like this. Okay? Got something there? Visual spatial. Now, when you're talking visual spatial, <coughs> these are things that use art to map work uh, as a means of expression. They have posters, PowerPoint, graphics, graphic designers and architects. Do you think I am a visual spatial person? I try to be, okay? But for the first 20 years of my teaching, I didn't use a single PowerPoint. I still have students say, So, visual spatial. Now, if you look at your sheet, can you tell which one is visual spatial? And are you in that category? Visual spatial is this one, museum color. Okay, museum color, okay. Verbal linguistic. So when you look at ver verbal linguistic, they see the world through words. My last three games have been verbal linguistic. Okay? The whole world is words. And when you go to a meeting, you know that. Not that they're bad people, but they talk a lot. Okay, things they like to do. Writing process. Type poetry. Letter diagram. Book reports. Types of writing, parts of speech, proofreader. I love verbal linguistic people when I do work because they read all my stuff and tell me my mistakes. Mm -hmm. Right? I keep them close to me because I know that's a weakness of mine. So is that you? Are you verbal linguistic? By the way, nobody is 100% anything. You need to know that I teach, or I did teach online. 